Hi, this is the Wyoming Traveler. Welcome to my channel. In 2021, I will be making a series of videos on forts of the western frontier during the periods between 1850 and 1890. As I began planning this series, I thought I should give some general information about the forts, the people who live there, and how the posts were organized. History scholars and individuals with knowledge of this period will know most of this information. But <clears throat> those who are younger or are not familiar with this period of American history may not. So let's go look at Forts of the Western Frontier. After the Mexican War and the division of Oregon between the United States and Great Britain, large numbers of people began to move west. These numbers increased significantly after gold was discovered in California in 1849 and in the Rocky Mountains a few years later near present-day Denver, Colorado. Following the Civil War, the number increased even more and a greater military presence was needed. The purpose of the army was to protect and police. The army guarded railroad and telegraph crews. They protected travelers and settlers who lived along the frontier. They enforced Indian treaties and kept peace between the various Indian tribes. Often, they also served as law enforcement. When seeing these forts, the most obvious observation is that there are no walls or other types of defensive fortifications. The reason for this is simple. Fort defenses were not needed. The forts themselves were located miles and even days away from large concentrations of Indian population. And also, the Indian style of warfare did not involve campaigns or attacking uh, soldiers primarily. Mostly, they would target isolated settlements or groups of people. It was also not unusual for the Indians to con congregate near forts, and they would do this for several reasons. First was to go to the forts to collect annuity or treaty goods. Uh, they would also go to the forts seeking protection from the military against uh, tribes which they were hostile to, and frequently they would go to the forts and demonstrate their peacefulness towards the U.S. government. An example of this Indian army relationship can be seen in the Grafton Massacre. This occurred near Fort Laramie in 1854. Lieutenant Grafton and 29 men went to a Sioux camp to investigate a charge of stolen property. The discussions went awry, and as a result, Grafton and his men were massacred by the Sioux Indians. Following the massacre, the Indians attacked a trading uh, post, uh, took the goods there, then ran off some horses and mules, which were near Fort Laramie. But at no time did they attack the fort itself or any of the soldiers located there. Uh, following their raid, and they left the area. The Arapaho and Cheyenne, on the other hand, who were in the area to also collect their annuity goods, stayed, received their goods, and then they left. Approximately a year later, the army sent out a force to punish the Indians involved in the uh, massacre. The Indian agent at Fort Laramie sent word out to the various Indian bands to come and locate near the fort and demonstrate their peacefulness. Uh, several of them did. A few forts did, however, have walls, such as Fort Phil Kearney and the other forts along the Bozeman Trail. 
These forts were deep and hostile territory, and the troops stationed there were subject to constant attack. And whenever they left the safety of the fort walls, the forts themselves, however, were a never attacked. The fort structures were usually built of log, stone, adobe, or sod. Construction was often done by the soldiers themselves. In the later years of the 1870s and into the 1880s, post buildings were improved. Let's talk about the men who garrisoned and lived in these forts. There were two major categories, the soldiers and the civilians. Yes, civilians did work for the military on these Western posts. But before we get into that, there's a couple uh, housekeeping chores I'd like to get uh, settled. First of all, I wanna talk about my quote uniform. Uh, <clears throat> as I was planning these videos, I thought, you know, it would really look neat if I could dress somewhat like a soldier on the frontier. And I ran across a YouTube channel called Country Tactical. And in the cha this channel, uh, the individual describes how you can make uniforms from items you can purchase at local uh, stores, flea markets, or even online. And I will leave uh, Country Tactical's link uh, down below. The other thing I want to mention, which I will also leave in the link below, are the books that I use for reference in this material. So if you want to learn more about the <clears throat> life of the frontier soldiers and their forts, you can consult these uh, books. The last thing I want to discuss is a little, um, I guess you call it a prop. <laughs> okay, this is not a real uh, saber. It's a replication of the sabers that were used by the army. Uh, it's the only weapon I have um, <clears throat> that uh, <clears throat> for this period. And if things work out with this channel, I'll see if I can get some more as well as some uh, more attachments for my uniform to make it uh, somewhat uh, more authentic. We said that <clears throat> the men that were living at these uh, posts were two groups, soldiers, civilians. The soldiers were divided into three groups. There were the privates, the non-commissioned officers or sergeants, or NCOs, and the officers. We'll talk about the privates first. The average age for a private in this time was about 23 years old. Now, <clears throat> you could not enlist in the army in the late 19th century until you were 21 years old. But remember, this is an age before all of our personal data was uh, computerized. So how did the recruiting sergeant know if a person was 21 when he walked into the door and said, hey, I want to enlist? Uh, <clears throat> the individual might be able to provide some documentation, family Bible, a baptismal certificate, but in a lot of cases they didn't. So the recruiting officer looked at the individual, said, yeah, you look 21, sign your name or make your mark. So you had a lot of people under the age of 21 joining the army. Also, the maximum age for first time enlistment was 32. Now, once you were in the military, you could re-enlist, you could be older than 32. But initial enlistment, you could not be older than 32. Once again, how did you prove it? You might have some documentation, but once again, recruiting sergeant looks at you, says, yeah, you look 32, sign your name, make your mark. So the average private was anywhere from, say, 15 years old to maybe 40 years old in their first term enlistment. 
Now, <clears throat> enlistments lasted from three to five years, depending on uh, what you signed up for. And as I said, if you decided you wanted to stay in the army, you could re-enlist 90% of the time, you would re-enlist in your old company. So soldiers could spend their entire career, 20, 25, 30 years in the same company or regiment. Now, <clears throat> education wise, we often think of people in the late 19th century as illiterate. Yes, some soldiers were, a lot of them were, especially if you were an immigrant and a lot of immigrants joined the army, uh, <clears throat> but not all. Many could read and write. Some had the equivalent of a college education or even an actual college education, as we'll see later on. Uh, <clears throat> now, why did people enlist? They enlisted for the same reason people enlist today. Well, not exactly the same reason, uh, but many of the same reasons. Uh, number one was adventure. Young man spent his life on the farm or in a city. He wanted to get out, do something exciting. The military offers a exciting life, theoretically. Not always true. In fact, most of the time, it's going to be boredom and monotony. But you don't know that. You read your books, you see pictures, you hear stories. Hey, join the army, see the world, have an adventure. So that's what many of them would do. Others are joined for the same reason they do today, economic reasons. Can't get a decent job can't find a job, and so they would join the army. Uh, <clears throat> the other reasons are what I call the negative reasons. These were people who joined the army to escape legal difficulties they were in, to escape debt, or to escape a negative family situation. And once again, no computerized uh, personal information, you enlisted under an assumed name. And it would be virtually impossible to track you down uh, if you didn't want to be tracked down. Uh, <clears throat> another group of people who enlisted were what, uh, not what, but were cashiered officers. These were men who were office officers and for misbehavior, cowardice, whatever, negative reason, they had been court-martialed and discharged from the army. But for them, military was their only life. And so once again, under an assumed name, go to another uh, fort and enlist. You even had former um, Confederate soldiers, even officers, who would enlist. Once again, men who had been in the military, liked the military for whatever reason, felt comfortable in the military, and could not adjust to a civilian life, and so they would enlist in the Army. Now, I mentioned the types of uh, people who were in the army. Let me read from you uh, 40 miles on beans and hay. It's be referenced uh, down below. But here's a description of the men that were in this particular uh, company. And he writes, We have a printer, one telegraph operator, a doctor, two lawyers, three professors of languages, one harness maker, four cooks and bakers, two blacksmiths, one jeweler, three school teachers, 
as well as farmers, railroad workers, and laborers. So a mixed bag of men were in the military. Uh, <clears throat> as I mentioned, many of the uh, men who enlisted were, uh, were immigrants. Once again, same reason, couldn't find a job, may have even been in the military in the country that they left. Liked the military, felt comfortable in the military, and would sign up. There are estimates that maybe 50% of the 19th, late 19th century army was made up of immigrants. 30% of the men who were at Custer at the Battle of the Little Bighorn were originally from Ireland. And that doesn't include you know, men from other countries that were in the 7th Cavalry at the time. Um, now, as a private, the vast majority of them were single. Uh, two reasons. One, on the salary that they made, they couldn't afford a wife and family. And also, the army did not provide quarters for families, or at least families of um, did men. <clears throat> so even if you were married, you could not, you had no place to bring your family. Um, <clears throat> A private made $13 a month. And you think, how can you live off of $13 a month? Well, you could. But if you factor in inflation, that $13 is more like uh, $258. Once again, it's not a lot of money for a month's work. But in addition to your $258, the government gave you food, shelter, and clothing. So you didn't have to pay rent, you didn't have to buy food, and you didn't have to buy your clothes. Uh, so your $13, and we will see there were some expenses that were attached to that $13, but that was your money to go out and do what you want to with, and we'll talk about how they <coughs> soldiers entertained themselves uh, later on in this video. Okay, uh, now, as I mentioned, life on the frontier was not all excitement and adventure. It was mostly boredom and monotony. And um, also, you might have housing, but it could be very poor housing. The clothing wasn't the greatest in the world and the food was often described as almost unedible. So when you put all these together, isolation, loneliness, bad food, bad housing, then you had a very high desertion rate. In some units, the desertion rate was as much as 50%. Okay, the third group, second group would be your non-commissioned officers, <laughs> or NCOs, or sergeants, however you want to uh, call them. <clears throat> uh, they received their promotion out of their company. The company commander or a regimental commander would promote them. Vacancy occurred. Uh, <clears throat> the company commander select one of his privates to fill the position um, now, by virtue of their position, NCOs had to be literate, especially if you were in the quartermaster department. Uh, <clears throat> but you kept the rosters, you did the, much of the paperwork. So NCOs were going to be literate. Uh, they were privates who had demonstrated leadership skills. Some had been former officers. You would have um, 
once again, men who had been officers during the Civil War were <clears throat> no longer needed once the war was over, but for whatever reason, decided they wanted to be in the military, they would enlist. And because they had leadership skills, uh, <clears throat> they quickly uh, filled the ranks of the sergeants. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> the NCOs served as a bridge between the officers and the privates. If a private wanted to talk to his uh, platoon commander or his uh, <clears throat> company commander, he had to ask the sergeant's permission. Um, pretty much there was nothing that a private could do without permission of his sergeant. There was not a lot of day-to-day -day contact between officers and privates with few exceptions. I uh, wanted to tell a story. <clears throat> My father-in-law joined the army in 1936. And he told me back when he was in the pre-World War II army, he said, you never saw an officer except on two occasions. If you were getting a medal or if you were being court-martialed. So if that's how things were back in the early half of the 20th century, imagine what they were in the last half of the 19th century. Okay, the third group were the officers. These were the men who were in charge, the guys who wore the epaulets, second lieutenants through generals. Now, how did you get to be an officer? Well, there were basically three ways. One, was through West Point. The other way was either a direct appointment, was a direct appointment from the President of the United States. And we'll talk about how some people got those uh, positions. The third and smallest category were enlisted men after many years of service and written examinations could apply and become officers. But this was a very, very small group. Many of the officers, and these were the ones who got their direct commission, had been officers in the Civil War Army and decided to remain in the military uh, once the war was over with. And so getting a presidential appointment, they would go into the regular army. Now, most of the time, they went in at a far reduced rank than they had held when they were in the Civil War Army. A couple of examples. The famous General Custer. During the Civil War, he was a major general. When he died at the Battle of the, of the Little Bighorn, he was a lieutenant colonel. With him in his 7th Cavalry were two other officers that I know of. Excuse me, Captain Benty <coughs> had been a lieutenant colonel in the Civil War Army. Major Reno had been a colonel in the Civil War Army. Another officer we'll talk about much later on when we visit uh, the fort he was stationed at was Captain Fetterman. He had been a lieutenant colonel. And I could go down the list of <clears throat> frontier army officers that had served in higher ranks in um, the Civil War Army. And as I mentioned, even some of the NCOs had been Civil War uh, officers. Now, <clears throat> promotion in the Army was slow. It was on a fill-as-vacant need based on seniority. So, you had a major, retire, die, whatever, vacancy arises, and some captain is then appointed to that position. 
and then a lieutenant gets to be the first lieutenant gets the captain's position and then a second lieutenant gets the first lieutenant's position uh, <clears throat> but these were slow and very often sold officers would retire after 20 25 years in the same regiment as a first lieutenant or captain not unusual at all okay that's the military what about the civilians who live in the forts and worked in the forts what did they do these were government employees that were hired by the army to serve as wagoneers, supply clerks, laborers, um, <clears throat> mechanics, many different, it could be uh, scouts, many different fields that the <clears throat> government needed people to fill and didn't have the soldiers to do it. Now, if there was a choice between hiring a civilian, say carpenter, or finding a soldier who had some carpenter experience, or maybe not even have experience, they would use the soldiers. As I mentioned, many of the forts were initially built by the soldiers themselves because it was cheaper for the government to have the soldiers build the forts, fix the wagons, shoe the horses, then to hire carpenters and blacksmiths to do the same thing. The last civilian that was on the fort, <coughs> uh, a group, was the sutler. The sutler was an individual who had a license from the government to operate a store on the military post private organization. Uh, he would sell all the things that people would want, be it clothing, ammunition, food, whiskey, things, whatever individuals would want. The settler would attempt to get it and he would sell it. He also sold to any civilians that lived around the fort. So the settler's office or store was a very busy area on the fort and the center of all the social activities that were conducted. Okay, life on the forts was difficult. Housing wasn't the best. Food definitely wasn't great. People were isolated far away from anything. As you'll see as we tour some of these forts, even today, they're isolated. Uh, <clears throat> so it wasn't the all adventure and excitement. But the people did it and they lived there. And we'll go look at the basic large unit in a post in a post-Civil War army was the regiment. A regiment was made up of ten companies. Each company theoretically had a hundred men, but usually there were only about 60 men or even less per company. It was only on campaigns that units of the regiment were together. Regimental companies were separated across the frontier at different forts. Between two to four companies were stationed at each fort. Many people, because of Hollywood and fiction stories, think only cavalry units were stationed on the frontier. Infantry and cavalry units were stationed together on the frontier post. About two-thirds were infantry. The senior company commander, infantry or cavalry, was the fort commander. The frontier soldier had strong attachments to his company. It was his home. Most enlisted men spent their entire career in one company. Because of the slow promotion rate, officers usually stayed in the same com company for most, if not all, of their career. 
Life on the frontier posts was harsh. Many of the forts were located in isolated areas. The structures, the barracks, home, and other buildings were crude and often poorly constructed. The soldiers and other fort personnel were often housed in tents until the War Department decided to make the fort permanent. A soldier's life on the frontier was described as that of boredom and monotony, with few ways to entertain themselves. Pastime entertainment usually involved alcohols, gambling, or visiting the local hog ranches that were near the forts. Not all of Fort's population were men. Women also lived at the post. They fell into three categories. At the top of the female social order were the officers' wives. These women accompanied their husbands and except for combat, lived under the same difficult frontier conditions. They had no official status. They were considered by the army no more than camp followers. They could not draw any rations. Their housing was based on their husband's rank, which meant that they could be ranked out of their quarters. That was an army custom where the senior officer always selected their quarters and it went down the line. So if a new officer came on to a post, he could select any quarters of any officer that was below him. Then that officer would then take whatever quarters he wanted from whatever officer he outranked on down the line. If the husband of a wife died or was killed in combat, they had to leave their quarters immediately. They were not authorized medical facilities. However, in reality, they probably got medical help if they needed it. The most interesting group of women, I think, were the laundresses and hospital matrons. These women, as the name implies, did the laundry for the soldiers. They were the only officially recognized group of women on the post. Each company was authorized for laundresses. They were paid by item of laundry. They received military housing, a food ration, a ration of firewood, and were authorized military medical facilities. They were usually married to NCOs. They could make additional money by working part-time for an officer or his family. The work was physically hard, as one Irish immigrant laundress explained. The work was hard, but no harder than what I'd be doing in Ireland. The housing and food were better than I had in Ireland, and if needed, I had access to a doctor of medicine, and the pay was guaranteed. Post, there were no banks, direct deposit, or government mail checks. Pay was cash in hand to the soldier from the paymaster, who was generally an officer. On payday, which occurred whenever the pay wagon arrived, a bugle would call to announce payday. The soldiers would arrive at a designated location, usually the post headquarters, and report to the paymaster. Next to the paymaster was a representative for the laundresses and the post sutler. When a soldier reported to the paymaster, the representative for the laundresses would inform the paymaster how much the soldier owed for his laundry. That money would be taken out and given to the laundresses. The Sutler would then check his books, tell the paymaster how much the soldier had bought at his store on credit, then that money was given to the uh, sutler. Whatever was left 
was then given to the soldier. This video is a brief overview of life on the military post between 1850 and 1890. My desire is to help you understand the period and the people who lived and worked at these frontier forts we will be visiting. I have listed below a few books on the topic. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video and I hope you enjoy your visits with me to the Frontier Military Post.